Okay, so this was uh, the last probably two decades I have been working in this area, but now the last seven, eight years there has been a nice, uh, you know, re looking at various things, and I thought I should give a colloquium talk on what has been happening. I would say this is from 2012 till the present. Okay, so these words will look like you know arborescent, nano arborescent, and all these are things which I started learning from the Russians. And basically, like arboreal, a tree diagram, and non-tree diagram, these are the other kind of jargon. Conway apparently used recently. I got to know from one of these people. I think that Pratsiki, he was saying that this arborescent was called algebraic by Conway. So it was nice to know that. Even those days, Conway knew that there is a 90 out of 100, uh, 90 percent of the knots are arborescent up to 10 crossings and so on. So, they knew terminology and what percentage of the knots up to what crossings are algebraic or arborescent. So, it looks interesting. So, I thought let me put this and this term is independently six of them and another two of them, I, they, they came up with writing the polynomials for these knots and it is now famously called home fly pt and in 2009 in ictp we had a conference where you know all of them had come licorice uh, this is millet and uh, you know oceano a couple of people had come and it was a nice meeting to see the home fly pt gang was there they they had the ones who constructed these polynomials okay independently so there are okay so these are my students and this was a postdoc initially at TFR later on in perimeter and then he was in touch even when he was in Europe as postdoc. So we had written a couple of papers and this is my present student and this Vivek you have been seeing for the last two days here. And we also have an Indo-Russian project where we have been developing complementary things these people have ways of trying to answer non-arborescent, we have ways of answering arborescent and we can combine mix and match which I will call it as a hybrid. So a lot of things have been happening with this collaboration and uh, we have been updating, we have created a website where things are getting updated to different colors, by colors I mean like spin half, spin one, you can put different representations of SUN and so on, so various colors are getting updated up to not so far up to 10 crossings and we are hoping to get it updated up to 12 crossings. So that is why this stay tuned for updates in the website. I hope I have said what all are the jargons which are used here. So I will try my best to pitch it at a level that you will get a flavor of it and then we will. So. I will briefly, I am sure Vivek had given you a few examples, but just for the continuity sake, I will briefly review how we obtain not invariance from Chern Simons. I have very carefully said not invariance and not as not polynomials, because the calculation of the polynomials from these invariants is itself a, you know, a difficult situation, at least for the SUN. And uh, how we could compute the home fly pt, the notation itself which will be a polynomial in a variable. So this how we compute for a class of knots which I call it as arborescent, I will explain what is arborescent. And then the other method which has been started by the Russian team on computational methods for non-arborescent, I will briefly give you a feel of it and some of uh, the explicit calculations Vivek will do tomorrow at 2 o'clock. So one of them is this highest weight method. It's similar to the way we look at in quantum groups, putting in this co-multiplication and ladder operators is a very systematic exercise by which one can compute for, in fact, for any not obtained from closure of four or five strand braid, and that is really useful to compute for the non-arborescent knots. And there is another one which is hinged on this Yang-Baxter equation, which is called the eigenvalue hypothesis. It is a hypothesis because it makes a statement that you will be able to compute it completely using eigenvalues of the quantum R matrices. So in that sense it is a hypothesis 
and then as I said, we could mix and match the tools of arborescent knots and the tools of non-arborescent knots to get a hybrid approach where we try and get some more examples which are evaluated. The polynomial form can be evaluated by mixing both the methods. Okay, and then I will summarize. Okay, so Chern Simon's theory is a three dimensional theory and it is metric independent, action is metric independent and it provides a natural framework to study knots. So, knots are given by Wilson loop operators and on the Wilson loop you can put a representation R and the group of the Chern Simon's theory you can take it to be a gauge group G and K this calligraphic K refers to the knot and you can work out the expectation value in this quantum field theory. And these are what we call it as a knot invariants. They are gauge invariant as well as you know topologically invariant. So, just for the uh, knowledge with the knot theory literature, if you put the group to be SU2 and take spin half representation, this is a Young diagram representation for it on the knot. So, on the Wilson loop, you put spin half representation of SU2 and if you evaluate it up to an overall normalization which we take it to be unnot because the not not in not theory people use a not invariant to be one if we put a normalization then we get the uh, corresponding jones polynomial where we can map what this variable so the polynomial is in variable q and this has correspondence to the coupling constant k in chern simons so, similarly, home fly PT as I said will correspond to SUN gauge group where you put the fundamental defining representation on the Wilson. Kaufman will correspond to taking the vector representation of SU SON on not K. So, this is the way various different not invariants can be computed within Chern Simons theory by changing the gauge group and the conventional known knot theory literature polynomials corresponds to putting the defining representation. And we have more general knot invariants where we can put arbitrary representation, arbitrary gauge groups and these are what we call it as generalized knot invariants and useful to attempt classification problems. In fact, with Ramesh Kaul and TRG as a student, I was looking at a class of knots which are called mutant knots which I will briefly mention towards the, when I am computing the arborescent knots where we tried to show that classification of knot and its mutant or distincting, the distinguishing mutant knot from its partner was impossible within Chern Simon's theory, but now we have kind of corrected if we start looking at different representation not just symmetric representation I will get, get back to some corrections. Okay, so as I said 1992 the, I have been in this for the so maybe 2 3 decades now going to be uh, we have essential tool is to connect Chern Simons theory on a 3 dimensional ball with a boundary which you take it to be a S2 boundary where you will have a conformal field theory. This is one kind of ingredient. Another ingredient is every knot you will be able to draw it as if it is a closure of a braid. So, this is a closure of a two strand braid with three crossing. So, here it is one, two, three strand braid, but I have done closure here and a plait here. So, we sometimes call it as a quasi plait. This is a plait diagram. And, and so on. So, you can either draw it as a plait or a quasi plait or a closure. Okay. Every knot can be drawn this way. So, this falls into the theorem of Alexander and Berman. So, let me briefly go over what Vivek would have done for you. If you take a trefoil, which is the simplest non trivial knot in the 3 sphere S3 you can try to view it as a closure of a two, two strand braid with three crossing, but then as I said one of the ingredient is that you can slice it into two three balls with oppositely oriented S2 boundaries and associate a state in the conformal Mezumino conformal field. So, the subscript 3 includes that there are three exchanges between functors on the boundary. Okay. So, that 
is taken care here and 0 is that there are no exchanges between these two punctures and to write the functional integral of such a Wilson loop expectation value you can try to write it as a number which will be nothing but the inner product of psi 0 with psi 3 and this can be rewritten as if there is a uh, monodromy braiding operation which exchanges the punctures which which I call it by b, b to the power of 3 on psi naught. Okay. So far I have written the formal way of writing the invariant, but I have not worked out the polynomial. But to work out this polynomial usually what do we do if you want to write it out, you have to go to a basis where this braiding operator is diagonal. So that is what we do and uh, since this is a 4 punctured boundary. So, you can look at the 4 point correlator conformal blocks in Vesumino conformal field theory. Typically, if you are not looking at knots, it could be 2 of the representations could be different, other 2 could be different or all 4 could be different if there are multi component knots. So, this is the most general basis which you can use if there is an exchange between puncture 1 and puncture 2 or puncture 3 and puncture 4 or you will use this basis if you have exchange between the middle two punctures so, and you have to know how to go from one basis to another and that should be a unitary transformation and these are precisely called as the duality matrices and you can work out we can work out the properties of these duality matrices from equivalence of different knots you know the same knot can be drawn in different ways and you can work out the properties of this this matrix and it turns out that their properties are exactly like the Wigner 6 j or the quantum Braga coefficient. Okay. So, this is the duality matrix which relates between the two bases which is needed to work out the polynomial form of the invariant. Okay. So, since I am going to confine myself to knots, you will have two of the strands ingoing and two of the strands outgoing. So, ingoing strands I will represent it by representation r and the outgoing by r bar depending on the orientation and then we work out by writing the state as a complete set of bases in terms of this because I am going to do the braiding in the middle two strands this is the convenient basis and we write it and sorry this should be t and you can fix this coefficient by taking the inner product of psi naught with psi naught that should give you an unknot squared to it is an unlink and we can fix the normalization of the unknot which will give you this coefficient. So, then now we can evaluate this polynomial form automatically using the quantum dimension of a representation I am sure he would have talked about the quantum dimension of the representation and the braiding eigenvalue. So, you substitute this quantum dimension this will be in variable q and what is this eigenvalues? Eigenvalues are given by the quadratic SMS of the representation involved in the braiding and what is the composed representation. So, S is an element of R cross R. So, you can write the quadratic SMR for them. So, essentially everything the final result is going to be in variable Q. So, if you take representation R to be spin half representation, you can check whether you get back your Jones polynomial up to a not normalization as I said and uh, this I am sure he would have worked it out. So, next is the next non-trivial one if you see here is involves braiding between first and second puncture, second and third puncture. So, you will have a duality matrix to go from one basis to another basis. So, this is the figure 8 knot which is also called in the uh, classification Tisselweit classification as 4 or Rolfson's classification as 4 subscript 1 and this again you can work it out here by using the fact that there will be relative orientation between the strands which undergoes braiding and also you have to go from side strand to the middle strand. So, we can systematically go from one to the other. So, there will be a duality matrix, there will be one eigen two braidings this way and two braidings for the other one and it is related by this duality matrix. So, it is a very systematic straightforward exercise. Once I have given you the tools at least for the four punctured boundary, you can start doing this and write out the polynomial invariant because each one is in variable q 
and this one is also the duality matrix. The only hitch is here what is this duality matrix? Q dimension you know, you should know what is this duality matrix and I uh, will come to that as, as an extension of what we did for this four, four punctured boundary which will give rise to braid or quasi plat braids which involves four, four plat diagrams. You can extend it to more than four strands by putting like this is what we call it as a finger, each finger has four punctures and they are connected, two of the punctures are connected to the next finger and so on. Finally, this one is connected by a periodic one. So, if you can draw any arbitrary knot by using this picture, you know they are called arborescent knots. Yeah. Yeah, so I have given you an example here. So, each finger you can have arbitrary crossings like uh, on the sides, middle and so on. So, so I have just given you a three finger diagram here, but in principle you can draw uh, any number of four punctured boundaries. Okay? So, the only thing interesting thing is that there is, uh, this is what we will call it as like a three vertex diagram if you just string the four, four of these lines into one single line it will be like a three vertex diagram and that vertex will have one representation. Similarly, this will be like an n vertex diagram or a k vertex diagram with a representation x. Okay. So, initially at least initially I thought all knots we should be able to redraw it this way, then the computation becomes easy. But then it was pointed out by the Russians that you know there is a class of knots which are arborescent which can be drawn. But there are a class of knots which are, which cannot be drawn like this. I struggled a lot. In fact, for 817, I could not succeed. And I was thinking I am not able to find the right set of crossings to do it, redraw it this way. But it was ultimately shown that it is a non-arborous knot. So, there is only a subclass which are arborous and there is a class which is non-arborous. So, these diagrams we cannot draw it the way you were doing. No, that is two finger diagram, right? The same. So now we'll now you'll take a three ball with two S2 boundaries. You can start breaking it. There will be one three ball with one S2 boundary, one three ball with one S2 boundary, one three ball with one S2 boundary, and then here in between you will have a yeah. So the same thing here also it will be at yeah, so that I can do in principle, SU2 I am able to do because the uh, duality matrices are known for any arbitrary representations. Unfortunately for SUN, we have some kind of a restriction and we wanted to redraw this way so that we could compute at least for symmetric colors. That is why this uh, method was important. But in principle what you are saying is right, we have to take any arbitrary diagram not worry about it and we should be able to take an n, n plat right, n strand uh, thing. Yeah, and that is right. So, here what is happening is the computation becomes much more simpler. I will just show you highlight it and then you will appreciate what I am saying. Okay, so Essentially, as you have already said, this can be obtained by gluing three balls, but some three balls will have more, two or more four punctured S2 boundaries. So, for example, if you see this diagram, which is looking like this, you can try and redraw it. This is 10, 152, you can try and redraw it in this fashion. In fact, uh, at some point, I remember uh, during my student time, Jones was here and he said that. Uh, 942 is a chiral knot and chirality cannot be detected by any polynomial. So, that is the time uh, Ramesh was insisting that I should work it out and that time we, we try to redraw that chiral knot in this fashion. So, this is also if you see it is a three ball with three boundaries and this is also a chiral knot 1071 is also a chiral knot and we try to redraw it in this fashion and we know how to compute these states easily and the state for this has to be formulated what should be the thing. Okay, so, I have given you some examples where 
we could redraw them into. So this knot also we have redrawn this way and this knot. So each of them are adverse. So the building blocks as I said if you have a 3 ball with 3 boundary you need this building block. If you have n boundaries or r boundaries you need this building block and this is what conventionally for figure 8 and trefoil I was using this building block. Okay. So these are the essential building blocks for which I should know what is the Chern Simons functional integral states are. Once I know that the gluing will just give you inner products and I can write out the invariants. So this uh, for the 3 boundary or R boundary, uh, this also was fixed by systematic uh, gluing. Suppose you take this and glue one of them, you should get back the answer with one less boundary and one unnot squared and so on. So this helped us to fix this coefficient. So these things were already there in, in fact uh, in the initial paper of SU2 and multicolored and this was extended to SUN also but at that time the focus was for computational reason but now we see that it is also required if you want to redraw it as an arborescent. So what is given one for you one Yeah and you can also say the other parameter is a rank if you keep it arbitrary rank of the group. But if you put the specific rank as SU2, then it will become one parameter or SU3, then it will become one parameter. Yeah. Yeah, and there are some things which were already there that you can redraw some of these diagrams in this fashion and this is for convenience. If we redraw, then we can try to evaluate these states as what this is. The whole list was, I think, was, was given for the SU2 and then generalized to SUN even in our my my student days and even prior to me Ramesh and TRG had done this. Okay. So, uh, this just to give a kind of a different flavor that you can try to see arborescent knot as if it is like a Feynman diagram dictionary that you have a 3 vertex diagram and you have a set of parameters which tells you how many crossings are in the 1 and 2 or 2 and 3 or 3 and 4. So you can put some parameters for them and you can try in uh, and you can have two three vertex connected by uh, you know uh, the two boundary which we call it as a propagator. So all these possibilities exist for the arborist and not. So it looks like if you shrink it, it looks like some kind of a Feynman diagram. It is just an analogy. Only thing what was interesting in our computational part was that we wanted to write one invariant in terms of the parameters. Okay. So, the parameters if you change the parameters they correspond to different knots and we wanted to write one universal invariant or it is what we call it as a family approach. If you could do that then by changing those parameters we can write all the polynomial invariants program becomes much easier. Earlier case by case every example we were working out the polynomial invariant. Instead we wanted to draw one universal diagram. If suppose I switch off some of these crossing, then I will get a different knot. So I can in that program of that invariant, if I put these to be 0 or these to be 2, I will get the different knot in it. So this is something which because of the Russians and the power of these computers, we were able to get to use this family approach. And uh, one of the uh, best family one which we were managing to write involved 7 parameters. And even in the 7 parameters, if you see, the this this could not be accommodated, not that f. The 7 parameters will be the number of crossings. Yeah, so here it will be like each one is on a finger. So this is anti-parallel, parallel. So going from anti-parallel to parallel with how many number of crossings you have will be one parameter. And similarly, parallel, anti-parallel, parallel. So this the n number of crossings is one parameter. So I can systematically see the seven parameters here, and I can keep changing those parameters. How many knots does this formula represent now? Uh, minus this amongst the ten crossings. Up to ten crossings. Up to ten crossings. All the knots are incorporated except this. This is the. This is what was the final update. Yeah, yeah. So it's a, uh, it's uh, like order-wise, it is very less. Yeah. 
okay so that was just for you know to make the writing the polynomial invariant for marias not we could do it because once we have one universal formula okay so coming back to writing the polynomial form till now i was just showing the invariant how to write and then i said i how to extend it to many fingers and how to write those invariant but by now you would appreciate that there will be only raka matrices on the four punctures in the four punctures you can have two of them to be r two of them to be r bar there can be of two types either the two consecutive ones will be anti parallel or uh, you know the middle two ones can be anti parallel middle two ones can be parallel so these are the two types of raka matrices or duality matrices whose explicit form in q variable has to be known otherwise i cannot write the polynomial form so if we do the way you are saying if you take n punctured and start doing it then we need more than these raka matrices and we have no clue how to write those matrices at present at least okay what is known is that kirlo restriction has taught us or has given us a way of writing the 6j symbol for su2 for arbitrary raka matrices both arborescent non arborescent can be worked out in fact he had worked out the complete solution for su2 for any n punctured boundary directly that's because this is available this closed form expression is available unfortunately or fortunately we were looking at studying a different class a uh, class of knots called twist knot invariants and in the process of studying this twist knot invariants we could try and infer what are the two types of duality matrix which i need for the arborescent knots at least for four boxes the spin 3 by 2 or spin 2 uh, up to that we could actually infer and we wrote down those matrices after we wrote it down we compared it with this kirlo restriction once we compared we saw a neat pattern okay so that's one of the which i consider to be a very important contribution that we could generalize this kirlo restriction at least for symmetric representation looking at these twist knot invariants and we would we were able to write those two duality matrices so once i had these duality matrices any arborescent knot invariant is in polynomial form was computed okay so that is one important work with satoshi and zoden who was i think a postdoc here in 2013 which i think uh, this exercise has to be done for other representations as well and that's still an open question if we do it then we have a analog of kirlo restriction for arbitrary represent then we don't need to worry about drawing it as arborescent diagram or non arborescent okay so this is one which we wanted to relook at the mutation operation so mutation is that you take a region in your knot which has two ingoing and two outgoing this is what they call it as a two tangle you can do a rotation by 180 degree about any of the axes so since it's a projection two of them will be independent axes so if i do a rotation by about x axis i'll get whatever is inside this room this way or if i do it by y axis rotation then i can get the other two tangle so what we had observed as during my student days was that this mutant operation this 180 degree rotation of a two tangle operation we had shown it to be an identity operation like doing nothing to it so if i take this piece and attach it to a knot the other complement of a knot or i take this piece and attach it to that knot because it's an identity operation even if the two knots are different i'm going to get the same invariant because it's an identity operation so this is where we killed we kind of thought that we killed the classification problem because we wanted to write a polynomial invariant if two knots are distinct the polynomial should be different but i have shown an example where if i glue this to a complementary piece or glue this to the same complementary piece i will get two different knots but because it's an identity operation 
I will get the same invariant. So, this is what was the puzzle and uh, later on this was we realized it is only an identity operation only for symmetric colors not for arbitrary colors and we need to go beyond symmetric like mixed representations in SU3 is octet representation we need to go to such representation if you want to try and detect that this mutation operation is no longer an identity operation. So, this is what was uh, interestingly there is a systematic way of sitting down and working out for each representation this 2 1 is like the octet representation of SU 3 2 boxes in the first row and 1 box in the second row. So, we can work it out, but it is a very tedious process in fact you and jokers had done this in SU 2014 and this is the first mixed representation for which this duality matrix was written down ok. Once they wrote this down we try to relook at the mutant pair whether it is an identity operation or not an identity operation. So, this is what we did and we showed that they are indeed distinct. So, this is the work with Vivek and Satoshi this recently got published in journal of North theory. So, what is the what is this additional thing which is coming from the mixed representation which we did not have it from symmetric colors. Symmetric colors if you take two symmetric representation and take a tensor product you will get various representation each of these representation will occur only once ok. But if you take two octet representation and take a tensor product the similar octet di diagram can come more than once right at least in the SU 3. So, that is the additional information that once you start with mixed representation there is something called multiplicity which comes into picture. So, if you take two of them 2 1 2 1 representation you do see that I have marked it in 3 2 1 is 3 boxes in the first row 2 boxes in the second row and 1 box in the third row which is the uh, diagram which is occurring twice in order to distinguish we add an additional quantum number. So, these are all 0 0 0, but then this representation occurs twice I am calling it as 0 and 1. So, this thing played a very crucial role. What is the other uh, zero in the yeah, so, there is a there is a different notation where you try to glue it with the you know conjugate of this representation. So, that the middle one is taken to be 0. So, this is I forget the name of this notation, but here for the practical purpose now you can take it as 2 1 cross 2 1 and forget about it. But if you are doing 2 1 with 2 1 bar then this notation is a neat notation to write it ok. So, whatever I had as a 4 point conformal block we will also have this extra quantum number which I am calling it by small r ok. So, this and it will also show up in the states ok. So, this is the modification and this in fact makes your duality matrix at least in this multiplicity region it will not be a 1 by 1 element it will be 4 by 4. So, that is the modification it will happen because you have to worry about R 3 R 4 and R 1 R 2 R 3 R 4 can be either 0 or 1. So, there are 4 possibilities and 4 possibilities. So, you get a 4 by 4 block due to the multiplicity ok. So, this was something which we had overlooked at least 2 2 decades ago because we were not but uh, right now since explicitly Ju jokers had worked it out we could see that this multiplicity plays a very crucial role. So, once this multiplicity is incorporated and we redo this mutation operation it is no longer an identity operation, but we get some sign factors here in writing those states and uh, this is for m x and m y. So, we wrote these uh, states explicitly to see what are those coefficients and then we parenthesis ones are just plus or minus 1 ok. So, and then we what we showed is that we can try to write the two tangle in terms of some coefficients and the corresponding m y mutation done on this two tangle we can write it with f tilde and these two coefficients are related up to a sign. So, if r 1 and r 2 had no multiplicity then f tilde will be same as f 
because R1 and R2 can be 0 or 1, in the 0, 1 situation you do see that it picks up a sign. And then we can write the difference between these two which depends on this coefficient. Okay. So, here I have used this other notation because the side 2 strands were anti parallel, but uh, if I put it side 2 strands to be parallel then I have to use the 2 1 notation. Okay. So, the crucial point is that this coefficient could have been 0. If this coefficient was 0 the mutant cannot be distinguished, but there are Kinoshita and Conway which is one of the famous 11 crossing knot this coefficient was non 0. But we do have situations like this pretzel pair, pretzel mutant pairs which starts from 12 crossing onwards which involves anti parallel braiding, there these coefficients are all 0. Okay. So, even 2 comma 1 mixed representation is not complete, it is not able to distinguish some of these mutant knots. Okay. So, one of the reason could be that multiplicity is only 2 here and you had only a plus or minus 1 sign, but if you start looking at other mixed representations, the multiplicity could be more and it may not be plus or minus 1 sign and maybe we will be able to distinguish. At least Morton says that some of these representation will distinguish this class of mutants, but we are yet to see it. The reason is we do not know the Raka matrix or the duality matrix. So, we are stuck on this. Okay. So, gluing back we worked out this explicitly the polynomial for this Kinoshita and Conway which is this famous 11 crossing mutants drawing this as a 2 tangle which I call it as a f tangle redrawn it this way where I know how to evaluate the states and uh, including those multiplicity factors finding those coefficients we could rewrite the polynomials for them. So, this was done in that paper which appeared in journal of knot theory for the mutant knot. So, this we specifically did because in Morton's work he had only written the difference between the two mutant invariants showing that it is non-zero and we wanted to show that computationally we can work out the explicit polynomial invariant using the Ju and Joker's Raka matrix. Okay, so far arborescent I have given you a flavor and I have also justified for you so far duality matrix for symmetric colors are available I can work out the polynomial form 2 1 color is available because of Ju and Joker. So, that invariant also I can write for arborescent knots, but how about the other knots like if you go beyond arborescent you do have even in this 8 crossing as I said there is a 8 18 and uh, 934 and uh, in the 9 crossing you can see there are 5 of them and 10 crossing there are many actually. Okay. So, up to 10 crossings we wanted to at least fill the website with all the polynomials for at least colors up to 4 symmetric boxes and we were stuck with these, these examples and this was one of the reasons why we were forced to get to using the other methods. Okay, so, the non arborescent other methods have to be done and we do see that it is not as neat and elegant as the way it was done for this arborescent knots, but it is systematic it is it can be done and uh, at least till 10 crossing we have been able to achieve and we are hoping that we will be able to go up to 12 crossing. Okay, so, this is uh, funding is from DST from our side and RFBR is the Russian foundation funding and this is one of the ongoing projects for. Okay, so, just to give a flavor of how the Russian team were looking at these invariants is nothing but if you have A1, B1, A2, B2 for a 3 strand as a sequence it is a 1 crossing is 1 minus 1 minus 1 minus 1 minus 1 is the sequence which I have drawn it here. There is a systematic way of writing it involving this quantum R matrices, uh, where you will see that if it is 1 and 2 it is R cross identity, if it is 2 and 3 you call identity cross R and put this appropriate powers of A 1 A 2. 
So, this uh, evaluation when you want to do it, if you put a representation r, then what you have to do is you have to take this in the tensor product of r cross r cross r. It is a huge space, okay. So, then it becomes very, very complicated. So, the best way to do it is that you work in the irreducible representation space. Instead of working on r cross r cross r, you try to write it in terms of the irreducible space which involves irreducible representation q. So, suppose you take fundamental, the 3 fundamental tensor product, you can take the 3 box 2 1 and 1 1 1. So, these, this is another way of simplifying the calculation and there is a systematic way in which this computation can be done and we can see that the symmetric and anti-symmetric is just some numbers. This is quantum dimension multiplied by the eigenvalues. But what happens in the 2 1 sector is that the 2 1 representation can come from symmetric multiplied by fundamental or anti symmetric multiplied by fundamental. There are two paths to reach to the 2 1 representation. So, that will bring in a non trivial matrix which is a u 2 1. And this evaluation of these non trivial matrices can be done from various approaches, is what they had shown us. So, R 2 in principle is u q r 1 u q. If you do not have more than one part, then this is all identity matrices. If you have more than one part, then this will be the dimension of that number of parts which are involved. Something is shaking, is it because of my, okay. Yeah, so this is what I was saying. So, essentially if I want to write the polynomial form here, I need to work out these u q's for non trivial, it is non trivial when there are more than you know 2 or more parts, we need to work this out and there are two methods. One is this highest weight method where you determine these u matrices. The other procedure is whatever I have said for 3 strand, I could continue this for 4 strand also, but then it will involve new kind of unitary matrix. So, that will be the only complication, but we have a systematic way of using this highest weight method which uh, Vivek will do with an example to show you, but I will briefly explain the steps in the next few slides and we have a way of doing it for up to m equal to 4. In fact, you can go to higher stands also, but it computationally becoming messier. So, the highest weight method essentially involves the raising lowering operators and co multiplication which is defined here, where if you take this to be the highest weight vector, you can lower it to the, the lower weights of this highest weight vectors. And uh, for example, this fundamental representation highest weight vector you denote it by 0 and then you start doing T 1 which will give you 1 and so on. If you start with 2 box, you call the highest weight vector as 0, 0 and then you do this co multiplication operator and we can start writing those highest weight. Once you start writing these highest weights for the 2 comma 1, you will be able to see that there are 2 possibilities and we can fix. See if you take 1, 1, the first level it becomes symmetric and anti symmetric, the 2, 1 can come from 2 possibilities and this can be worked out by looking at the highest weights which you can get from here and the highest weight which you can get from here and you take the inner product of those two states and that will give you this matrix and this is something which looks similar to our uh, SU2 quantum Wigner 6 years. Okay. And similarly, if you go to more strands, suppose I go to 4 strands, then I have to worry about tensor product of 4 representations, then there is a systematic way of seeing u matrix involves the 1, 2 and 3 alone and then you can have a v matrix which is this and then again a u matrix and you can complete this diagram. So, just as an example because in particularly in the recent paper we looked at this 2 colored 4 strand braid. So, you can start seeing that phi 1 is with multiplicity 2, 6 0 is no multiplicity, 4 2 is 3 and the final 6 2 has 6 multiplicity and that will define for you the u and v matrices, what should be the dimensions of those matrices. 
Okay. The other interesting and much more elegant approach which they had. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. But this circle coefficient is not the so the way I look at there is that it is R R R R, right? In the arborescent case. Here it is involving R R R and Q is what I thought. So six point eight eight point no generalized rack of yeah, but I don't know those coefficients. So, so that gives you an efficient method of getting Raka coefficients for larger groups. It appears to be that this can be inferred as a Raka coefficients for some specific representations. But uh, yes, by you by using this method, I can get those Raka matrix elements using the highest weight method explicitly. But uh, from this, can I get a kilo restriction kind of formula is still an open question. That is the only issue. Here I am just looking at the U matrix and inferring the U matrix by systematically writing the weights. But uh, I could not have written this matrix without uh, even this case without doing those. I had to get this by a systematic exercise and we have some handle on three strand braid like we have generalized this that it turns out to be the SU2 Raka coefficients. Yeah, it, yeah, it is the SU2 Raka coefficient even for SUN. Six six more, right? Yeah, even for SUN yes. it is the SU2 Raka coefficient. But if I go beyond three to four it appears to be a SU, SU3 Raka coefficient, but we have not been pinning down to what those coefficients are. This is where we are stuck, yeah. Yeah, as you rightly pointed out, we are narrowing that problem to somehow get some access for the SUN, the formula which is similar to Kirlo Reshtikin. I am hoping it will happen, but with lot of data points, we will be able to guess this what we think. But there are multiplicity issues. Symmetric does not have multiplicity, so we do not need to worry. But if you have more than uh, symmetric, then we need to worry about multiplicity issues. Okay. So, this is another hypothesis where the R matrices are diagonalizable given by these eigenvalues. So, the claim is all the u, v, so the, the Saigon values I have already said earlier involving the quadratic Casimir which you can rewrite it in terms of the number of boxes of the Young diagram, Young diagram in this R cross R. But what is being claimed is that we can impose these R matrices to be solving this Young box which is also not new, but this hypothesis claims that I can try to write the U and V matrices which I was saying in the earlier picture purely involving functions of the eigenvalues. Okay. So, that is the claim using these properties you can determine the U and V matrix elements in terms of eigenvalues. So, that is a very big step I do not think we understand the proof, but explicitly one could write it out for some cases. And that is what was done where we could see that it was square root of lambda 1, lambda 2, you know it is very nice to rewrite it, but we do not have a proof that is why it is called as a hypothesis that the U and V matrices at least can be written as functions of this braiding eigenvalues. And once we had this in this recent paper, we could try and uh, compare our highest rate method. That is right. And uh, is, is, isn't that uh, what I have constructed the uh, inverting the using uh, varying eigenvalues from the uh, term family and you construct the full R matrix? No, no, full R matrix is okay. I want the U and V which relate R1 to R2, where the U matrix elements 
are given by square root of lambda 1 by lambda 2, lambda 2, lambda 3, you know, I, I, I have a systematic way of writing it. But uh, uh, there also are matrix position in terms of uh, eigenvalues. Our matrix is dialysable and you can write it in terms of eigenvalues. Just that is known. Yeah. And then our matrix was explicitly written in terms of the churn term coefficients. Uh, the churn term is just like Klebsch coefficients. Yes. Yeah. That's the complete R matrix. That I agree. That's our matrix. If you look at that, has all these properties. That should have a score because that's already explicit. No, but this U's are not the Klebsch coefficients. They are not, but huh. they would be combinations of the ones that are there already in those constructions. They are not exactly Klebsch no, but they would be just No, because this R matrices are in the uncoupled basis, but here you are still taking it. If I take a spin half particle, I am going to take it as a 2 by 2 matrix. Yes. So, there yes, is some subtlety. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, so this was what uh, mentioned and we validated this with the highest rate method and uh, the explicit calculation was done for the symmetric rank 2 representation writing down the 4 strand. Uh, in the 4 strand case you will have within 1 and 2, 2 and 3 and 3 and 4, so I am repeating it. So, we worked this out mainly because up to 10 crossing all the non arborescent nodes will fall into this class can be accommodated in this class at least the two colored we did this and we completed that list for the two colored home fly PT for all arborescent and non arborescent using this mix and match of these two procedures. Okay, so, this was recently which appeared this is Vivek and Shashwati is another student of mine and this has been submitted. Okay, so, just to complete the story we could also combine the kind of things which we did where we will have a mix and match of the 4 punctured boundary and you add an additional strand where you treat this to be following the Russian method and there is a list of non arborescent nodes at least the 9 crossing ones which can be redrawn in this hybrid way. Okay. So, this also was worked out using the mix and match where if you see these are given by those finger states and uh, we could write out the invariant for at least the fundamental representation and these finger states involve those two types of this duality matrices and the braiding matrices. Okay. So, just to summarize, so R colored home fly PT at least I have showed you that since we have the duality matrix for any symmetric colors, I can work it out, we can work it out for arborescent nodes of any number of crossings are computable. Colored home fly PT of nodes obtained from 3 strand braid for mixed representations up to 4 boxes are computable. So, 3 strand braid closure is also I, ex I showed you how it is done for the by the highest rate method and we could do it up to 4 boxes that is also updated. Two colored home fly PT of all non arborescent not from 4 strand braids we have recently achieved, but this has not been done for 3 color and 4 color which needs still it looks like a horrendous task. And R colored home fly PT of non arborescent nodes though method is straightforward the you know the computation appears tedious like that is what I am saying. I did this two colored, but three colored and four colored I find it to be very tedious and this is getting updated on this naughty book website and this is the integrality checks once I have these polynomial forms lot of conjectures have been made in the topological string context that will be the theme of tomorrow's talk. So, where I will explain what is the duality and what is expected and now this data which we have here is really useful to validate those conjectures. Okay. The open problems, these are rectangular boxes if you take tensor product of rectangular boxes like 2 comma 2 and so on, it is still multiplicity free. 
and there is still data on this for uh, you know up to I think 6 cross 6 comma 6 boxes the invariance just like we did for the twist knot I was hoping that you know with that data we will be able to write at least the kirlov reshtikin formula for these representation because this is also multiplicity free. Uh, we are trying hard but trying to find a closed form expression. If that happens there will be an additional data for this rectangular boxes. This is the eventual hope that with several methods of tackling the polynomial form we believe that there should be a way of getting a closed form expression like Kirillov Rashtikin. Of course, multiplicity is to be cleverly handled at least for non multiplicity cases we should be able to do it at least I see there is a horizon that there should be possible, but so far we have not achieved it. Extensions of this higher straight methods everything is straightforward if you go to links and they will be useful to get multicolored link invariants for non arborescent links for arborescent of course, the earlier method is useful. So, I am sure uh, in yesterday's talk Vivek would have motivated on this entanglement entropy from link invariants where these data are all really useful and uh, there are these class of links which are called hyperbolic links whose complements which are 3 manifolds they have a non zero volume and it seems like a selection rule that they have a non zero entanglement negativity. Initially we thought that volume can be generated, but we still have open questions on it that was your yesterday's talk by Vivek and let me stop here. Thank you. Yeah.